Hey everyone, uh, I just want to give you guys an update on my past two videos that I put out. I uh, don't want to leave anyone hanging. Um, I know the last two videos were my mom was in the hospital on a ventilator and I basically was talking to her through the nurses at the time. Um, so my mom passed away. Um, she did. She was tested positive for COVID. And knowing that, it was very difficult at the time to let the doctors and nurses and everyone who called me, to, it was very difficult for me to not only accept the condition she was in, but it was very difficult for me to accept to take her off of the ventilator that was basically keeping her alive. You have to remember, um, I couldn't see her physically. I was able to do the phone calls, but that wasn't giving me enough information because a lot of the nurses were telling me, yeah, she's awake, she, she definitely hears you, and she's responding to your voice, and she's um, telling yes and no answers and, and all that. So I wasn't really sure what her condition was and at the moment she was doing she was herself but she just couldn't talk and i felt at the time that they wanted to rush her off of the ventilator possibly to get someone else on there i mean i'm not a conspiracy person for sh per se but i i do want to also say that this is family that we're dealing with. This is family that we are um, dealing with. You only get one shot at this, guys. If you ever have to deal with something like this, I just the reason I'm making these videos and, and really talking about this is um, to explain and kind of help other people who are possibly going through the same thing that, that I did at the time. Um, Mom was a fighter. Mom fought tooth and nail to live. Her goal was to come back home. And I think, like all of us, we have the desire to live. It's the fight or flight, and we have survival skills that I think none of us will ever truly understand unless we're put in these situations. Our, our bodies, our mind, wants to keep us living. That is our, you know, natural design. We naturally we want to live. Um, so let let's talk about you know that week and, and leading up to it, and you kind of saw that in those videos previous. Um, so things that were happening was this: she was going downhill um, because of the COVID, because of the cancer, and. Unfortunately, sadly, when you have pneumonia, and which is kind of a form of pneumonia, I'm probably wrong, but um, her death certificate said COVID and pneumonia was the actual cause of death. But when you have these conditions like pneumonia and COVID and stuff, you can't receive the cancer treatments. Yeah, so those cancer treatments are very important in these last stages. Um, and unfortunately, she wasn't able to receive any cancer treatments while she was undergoing, uh, you know, while she had the COVID and slash pneumonia. So basically, towards the end, here's what happened. I'm going to kind of walk you through my last days with her and kind of what I went through as, as a, a human being dealing with my mother's passing and, you know, the hospital and all that. So, they call me up at 7 o'clock in the morning. I don't remember what day of the week it was, but it was 7 o'clock in the morning and they told me, we need you to come down to see her. She's not doing well. Okay, now, I was told, I never really got the full story on this. Could I go into the room if she was dying? Could I go to see her? Like, there was this, I never got the full, full story. So, 
apparently someone made a mistake when they called me up and they told me I could go see her. That's one version I heard. The other version was, we're making an extreme exception for you, Brendan. We're making an extreme exception for you. Okay. Um, I don't know which one it really is till this day, nor do I care. Because I did get to see her. I did get to see her that final day. So I go down in the hospital at... You know, by 8 o'clock in the morning, I'm there. I'm walking into the emergency room, and I they were like, Hey, hey, nobody's allowed in. I said, Wait a minute. So-and-so uh, nurse practitioner and so-and-so doctor, and I already called the the floor, and they said, Yes, yes, you, you're coming up. I said, Okay. So these people said I could come in. So I waited about a half an hour. Um, and then the one nurse practitioner came to meet me and she said, okay, you're going to go in to see your mom. Wow. But I need you to put on the hat, the mask, the goggles, the apron thing. I had it all. I was wearing basically at that point what they were wearing. And... They walked me in. Now, again, was this a mistake? Was there a communication issue? Some people told me, you weren't supposed to be there, but since the guy that called you up said you could come, we don't want to go back on that. Wh whatever. Whatever they, whatever. All I know is I came into the room and... So let me explain this COVID floor, which was actually multiple floors, but I was in the MICU, which is a medical ICU. They call it MICU, medical ICU. Um, it looked like a hospital floor, obviously, but there were things that were different. There was giant signs on the door, <clears throat> do not enter. This is basically for their own staff. I believe. Do not enter unless you have these things that you're wearing. I, I saw these giant plastic, uh, giant um, paper bags. Like you get a grocery store, those big paper bags um, with, with names written on them. I come to find out later what those were. Was that's the hospital staff's face shield, um, things that can be cleaned, but they don't want to share them. So one person, they put their stuff in those paper bags with their name written on magic marker. <clears throat> they had a negative um, ventilation system, which basically pulled all the air from that floor out through a filter and went outside so it was filtered air that was being pumped outside so it was very very different they had they, it was almost like a makeshift type of filtration system so i stand there for a little bit and i i, I had this very nice social worker um i'm not a giant fan of social workers i have trust issues when it comes to the system i guess if you will but this girl woman was very very good at her job very good so she brings me in um she's in the same outfit basically i am and we walk in and there's my mom she looked great she looked wonderful i didn't know what to expect I didn't know if she was going to be like a skeleton type of person. I didn't know exactly what the ventilator was going to look like. I didn't know. So I go in and she's watching TV. <laughs> 
and you know she's not res she, you know she's sitting up in her bed with a ventilator in it basically a a tube in her mouth she couldn't talk and my mom wouldn't shut up so it must have been very frustrating this whole week on this ventilator so I go in and her eyes widen up and she's really happy to see me and I got right in her face yeah social distancing my ass I'm like right here I'm like mom hi I'm here are you happy I'm here and she's nodding and her eyes are wide open and she's really excited and she's really and, and and of course you can't ask a lot of questions because you know it's it's basically I feel for her because she has a tube in her throat I can't be like you know hey guess what I did last week and it's you basically got to talk in yes or no questions and yes and no things so thing are you okay and she's really saying, yeah, I'm okay. She's probably doing that for me. I'm like, do you like the tube? She's like, mm-mm, I don't like the tube. Um, I remember saying, you know, hey, you know, are, are you happy I'm here? And yeah. And I, I couldn't stop saying I love you. You know I love you, right? And these were kind of like, in my, own, in my own way, these were my, this was my goodbye. Um... I also apologized for all the bullshit. I said, Mom, I'm really sorry for all the bullshit. And I said, you know, you forgive me. And she said, yeah. I said, are you, are you sorry for your bullshit? And she said, yeah. And I said, but you know, you didn't do nothing wrong, did you? Because <laughs> she always said, I don't do anything wrong. Of course you don't, Mom. Of course you don't. But this was closure. This was closure. And fortunately, I was able to have the closure with my dad almost the same way. I was able to apologize for the bullshit. I was able to tell him I loved him. And my dad and I, we, we were like brothers. My dad wasn't like a a father figure, he, he was, but our relationship, we were like brothers, and you know, I, I was able to, we didn't say, I love you, dad, we, that wasn't our conversation, you know, but I was able to say, I love you, dad, I, I, you know, and this and that, and I apologized to him for all the shit, you know, and I did that to my mom, and I was there for an hour with the social worker with my mom. And they're really like, listen, her condition's not good. I'm like, she's doing great. She's herself. She's fine. Well, after about an hour, I was able to look at, you know, the screen with all the numbers on it and all that. And they were kind of explaining to me what the numbers were and her oxygen level, our, our oxygen level, like, right now, is about 100. Um, her oxygen level is about 80. Dropping to 70, then the alarm would go off, and then it kind of went up a little, and it dropped back down to 70. That's very low. Um, I, I didn't know, I don't know about oxygen levels, but I know from what they told me, that's very, very low. And I was able to see on the screen her oxygen levels dropping. This was over the time that I was there. Um, she kind of got a little sleepy as the oxygen levels dropped. And the whole time, you know, I took the, the social worker and the one doctor who came in and out outside and they were they were really convincing me like hey we we should make her more comfortable which by the way just so you guys know making someone more comfortable means we're gonna we're gonna shut the ventilator off we're gonna give them a lot of medicine and shut the ventilator off um 
So if you're ever in a hospital been like, hey, you want to be more comfortable? Say, no, I don't. <laughs> and, you know, I could laugh about it now and all. And it was, it was tear jerking at the time. And I had the mask on. I had two masks and all this. And snots running down my nose. But I couldn't take the mask off. And like, oh, God, it was a mess. Uh, but I wasn't like balling. I was trying, I was trying really hard to hold it together. Um, so... Her oxygen levels were dropping as I was there. I feel, I feel she let go. I just feel that I was there. She knew I was there. She wasn't responding as well as she did when I first got there. And I told her, Mom, I am going to be okay. I got all the bills taken care of because, all right, here's the deal. I live with my, my mother lived with me for five years. She took care of all the bills. I went to work. She took care of the bills and she basically, I said, mom, here's my paycheck. You do what you need to do with it and you give me some money and for the, you know, spending money for the week and et cetera. She handled everything. I'm 38 years old. I never paid a bill in my life. I mean, listen. I'm not ashamed to say that. That happens all the time. Wives and girlfriends and moms. and That these things happen. Well, I had to learn how to pay bills this week. Not as hard as I thought it was. But anyway, going back. So... I wanted to make sure that she knew I was okay. I'm, I was okay. I'm gonna be okay, Mom. I'm gonna be just fine without you. You don't need to fight anymore. I love you to death. I really, really do. But you don't need to fight. Um. And... Slowly, she slowly lost more consciousness. Now, I was holding her hand, and her hand was warm when I first got there. Towards the end, her hands got cold. The ventilator's pumping as hard as it could pump. The oxygen's at 110. There's not much more they could do. Her hands were getting cold because her body was trying to put the blood in the core and in the brain to keep her alive. Her, this, we didn't, nobody shut anything off. So, at that point, when she was kind of out of it and her hands were getting cold, I, I, I said to the social worker, I said, it's, I feel it's time. I feel it's time to make her comfortable. Um, they ordered the medicine, which what happens, this is what they do. They give you medicine in your IV to make you sleepy. Um, but you're very conscious. Your, your brain, they, they don't shut your brain off. Your brain is still alive. Your brain is still working. What they do is they shut off. They make you put. They basically make you very sleepy. The next drug they put in you is anxiety medication. So you have no anxiety of anything at this point. All right. I said, you know, will she suffer? Will she? Will she be gasping for air? This is my biggest fear that she'll. When you shut the machine off, the ventilator, she can't breathe. They said, no. She won't suffer. We're going to give her the sleeping medicine. We're going to give her the anxiety medicine. She'll be able to hear you. She'll be able to hear everything that you're saying. I said, okay. It's time. Uh, she had an IV in her neck because her hands were... Um, it, 
something went wrong with her hands in the hospital. It wasn't terrible, but it was like the it wasn't taken through the IV, so they put it in her neck. Um, they put the IV in her in her neck, and the thing was is that I think she knew what they were doing, and she kind of like started to freak out a little bit, and I felt really bad because my biggest fear was that she knew I was putting her to sleep and. There wasn't much. She wasn't going to last the day. But. That was probably the hardest thing. To see her kind of flinch around a little bit. Trying to fight them back. And I think any of us would. Any of us would do that. We don't want to die. Nobody wants to say. I'm, I want to die. And, and you know I did say to the doctor. Uh, I said listen. You're saying to her. Can we make you more comfortable and more comfortable? I said, Doctor, I don't think she understands what you're saying. Why don't you come right out, or I will, and tell her, listen, we're going to, we're going to, this is it. We're going to put you to sleep and we're going to take you off the ventilator. And the doctor looked at me and said, Brendan, with all due respect, you have to understand that that is very cruel. I said, you know, you're right. Uh, Dr. Roberts had much more experience with this, but she said, if I couldn't ever tell a patient that I was going to cut their ventilator off. I mean, I couldn't tell, the doctor said, I couldn't tell a patient that we're going to end your life now. She said, that is cruel. I said, yeah, I agree. I agree, doctor. You're right. You're right. I agree. So, um, they came in, they put the drugs in her, she went to sleep, and they shut the ventilator off. Her breathing was very shallow and quick, but she didn't suffer. Um, it was a very quiet room. It was myself, the social worker at the foot of the bed, and a nurse and the doctor. And the doctor, I'd say she lasted about 10 minutes off the ventilator with very shallow breathing. But it wasn't like a panic. It was just very, very shallow. And... After about 10 minutes, the doctor took her vitals and they looked up at the clock and they said, I'm calling it 1123. And the doctor looked at me and said, I am very, very sorry for your loss. The room is dead silent. It was eerily silent. And I accepted the fact that she was gone. She looked beautiful. My mother was beautiful. Physically, she was a beautiful, beautiful woman. And, um, I have pictures of her when she was younger. God, she was hot. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> she was cute. She was cute. Um, I just remember her sitting, laying in that bed, and her hair was just, you know, she always had like this, um, Annette Monticello brown, dark hair, and she just looked really good that day, really good, and she just kind of was, you know, her head was down a little, and... I looked at the social worker and I said, well, now what? And I was still holding her hand. Her hand was ice cold, which that was creepy. It was creepy. To be honest. And I didn't really want to, I didn't want to hold her cold hand. But I was still like, had my hand kind of like on her shoulder lightly. Like, she was getting cold. But not because they just cut it off. Like I said, her body was given out. But I swear to God, she held in there till I was there. 
and I don't know what mistake was made or what exception was made, but I was in that COVID floor, and goddamn was I lucky. Was I freaking lucky. I couldn't have asked for more. The staff at, you know, St. Luke's, Bethlehem, outstanding. You know, I, I couldn't ask for more. They were right the whole time. I was more in denial over it, but what are you going to do? You, you, it's natural to be in denial over it. It's natural to say, oh, no, I think she'll be all right. Like, what if there's that slim chance that a, a stage four cancer patient who hasn't had their medication in two weeks because of the COVID and nobody on a ventilator, according to the hospital staff, nobody on a ventilator has come off the ventilator and lived except one person and they were young and they had no health issues and they were still in the hospital. The odds were against her and I knew it. I knew it. Oh, of course I knew it. But I thought like she would want me to fight for her. She would, you know, you have to have these conversations in life. You have to have the, hey, if you're ever on a ventilator, what should I do with you conversations? And she said to me, this is a couple of years ago, just joking around, don't take me off the ventilator. I want to live. I said, Ma, would you take me off? No, I would never take you off. All right, cool. But, so, the big question is, what if I didn't take her off? What if I just kept her on? I, I could have done that. I could have done that. I, I, my, it wasn't my choice. But she, I kept telling them, listen, talk to her. What does she want to do? Talk to her. And they're like, listen, everybody's going to say they want to live. Well, yeah, so keep her on if she's still alive. Mm. Well, here's the deal. Don't let the hospitals rush you into a decision about your loved one. You make that decision over time. You make that decision in their best interest. So what if I kept her on it that day? I could have. She most likely would have gone into cardiac arrest and really suffered. And really felt pain and out of breath. And, and she would have died in an uncomfortable state. And when I was there, when I saw her oxygen levels dropping, I felt her hand get cold. That's 